is rigid body kinetics. Um, up until now, we've been treating everything as a particle. Um, so there's some new things. Now, um, objects will have length dimensions. And we will be able to take orientation into account. And rigid body kinetics uh, can happen in 2D or 3D. Um, we're going to be doing it in 2D. Uh, the um, yes, I, I would say that it, they go hand in hand because um, there's no way to distinguish one spot in a body from another if you're treating it as a particle. Um, And if all the forces are acting at the same point, there's no moments either. So now we're gonna start talking about moments. Um, so the 2D thing, uh, we're talking about objects, you know, so now we're thinking about something like this, but we're only talking about how it moves in a plane and it can change its orientation as it changes its position. Um, a lot of times with a lot of things in physics and mechanics, going from 2D to 3D is a really simple idea um, like it's really just adding you know one or two more variables into your equation um, this is different from that actually going to 3d makes this super super complicated and hopefully at the end we'll have time to for me to sort of do just a little thing about how you would extend this to 3d but I'll try to bring up the differences as we go through this to sort of point out where the pitfalls are you know, if you try to take this to 3D. Okay, so um, for rigid body kinetics, uh, well, first let's think about particle kinetics. Um, what's the equation of motion in particle kinetics that relates kinetics to the causes of motion? Newton's second law, yep. So now with rigid bodies, uh, we have two equations of motion. Uh, the first one is still Newton's second law. And that says that if you add up all the forces on the chosen body, so F net, that's equal to the mass of the chosen body times the acceleration of its center of mass. Um, specifying the center of mass was kind of redundant when we're talking about particles because a particle we treat is only existing at the center of mass. But now we have to be very careful about the fact that we're doing calculations involving the center of mass. Because if you have a body going, you know, changing orientation as it moves, the different, uh, the different points on the body have different accelerations. You know, if I do, if it's rotating like in a circle, uh, when this point at the top going in a circle like this has an acceleration down, the point at the bottom has an acceleration up. They can't both be equal to the net force divided by the mass, you know. So you need to specify one point uh, where Newton's second law holds. So that's the first equation of motion. And in 2D, that gives how many equations? Yep. Uh, so that's two equations in 2D. And then the second equation of motion is what I call the rotational version of Newton's second law. That's the moment equation. And that says if you add up all the moments, yeah, 
um, add up all the moments about some about point A, so I'll call that MA net. That's equal to the mass moment of inertia about A times the angular acceleration vector of the body. Yeah. Uh, that stands for moment. Um, in oh. physics, you might have seen that as a tau for torque. Um, a, in engineering, a torque is a very specific combination of moments, and so we're going to call it capital M moment. That's the about point. Um, and in two dimensions, uh, how many how many useful equations does a rotational equation give you? If you're working in 2D, uh, how many useful equations do you get out of a, any angular equation? One. Yep, because there's only one plane that it can rotate in. It's either positive or negative. Uh, so this is one useful equation. And so for all of these planar problems, a single rigid body is going to give us three useful equations. Um, now, Okay, so most people in here have taken static. In static, uh, the way that it works for rigid bodies is you have f net is equal to zero vector, and the sum of the moments is equal to zero. Uh, what are your options when you're choosing an about point in static? Um, so. Well, we're talking about 2D. Um, so say that you have, you know, you have a, let's see, this is, so look at this in 2D. Okay. Um, say that, say that you're trying to do the statics of this screen, um, just in a plane, the plane that you're looking at. Where can you put the about point and use that moment equation? Can you put it? Left point on my side. Okay. So yes. But do you have any other options? That's kind of, what? Anywhere, yeah. Okay, so, and and you're right that there is a, probably a best place that makes the math the easiest, but the key thing in statics is that uh, anywhere you want, you can put the about point. And uh, one of the just couple of things that I don't like about doing statics before dynamics is that it gives you a bad habit in this sense. You get this sense that you can put this about point anywhere you want. If the thing is moving, all of a sudden there are only two possibilities for where you can choose your about point. So for the rotational Newton second law, this about point A has to be either um, a fixed point in the coordinate system. So by a fixed point, I'm talking about like a joint between the body and the ground. on the body that's held fixed to the coordinate system. Or you only have one other option, and that's the body's center of mass. Those are the only two that you can choose. And is there any law saying that whatever rigid body you're looking at has a point that's fixed to your coordinate system? No, you know, like if this rigid body is flying through the air, there's no point on it that's fixed the way it would be if there was like a joint connecting it to the ground. Okay, so this doesn't always exist. Okay, 
the center of mass always does exist. So you could just always put the about point at the center of mass, but it's also always more like there's more math involved when your about point is the center of mass. So um, this always exists. But it requires uh, doing more math than if your about point is at a fixed point. Okay, so we're gonna see, you know, we'll we'll have a lot of views, like it'll be easy for us to see as we go on why, what are the benefits of having your about point be at a fixed point if it's possible. Um, otherwise, we just say, well, forget about the fixed point, just always do it the same way at the center of mass. But you get a nice benefit out of doing it at, at the fixed point if you can find it. Uh, okay, so what does this, um, what does this tell us? Um, so, there are three new things we have to define. Three new things we need to define. before we can do rigid body kinetics problems. The first one is the center of mass. Um, that's easy for very symmetric shapes, uh, squares and rectangles and circles. You have a pretty good sense of what that is. It, the centroid, the center of mass is just the geometric center of it. But for more complicated shapes, we're going to have to actually calculate that. Uh, the second thing that we're going to have to define is that mass moment of inertia. Uh, that's the thing in the rotational Newton second law, uh, capital I sub A. And you can think of that as sort of the rotational version of mass. Uh, it's a body's resistance to having a rotation started or stopped. And then the third thing is the moment. I'll call this the moment of a force. We'll call that capital M sub A. In both uh, two and three, both of those cases, that A refers to the about point. Uh, and if you look at that rotational version of Newton's second law, notice that, um, I mean, we've been dealing with angular acceleration, so maybe this isn't a surprise. But this moment at an about point, you can't define a moment without an about point. You can't define the moment of inertia without an about point. But angular acceleration does not depend on an about point. Okay, that just has to do with how quickly the front of something or you know is changing. Yep. Yes. And they both have yeah they have to be the same. So they both have to meet those two you know one of those two. Um, okay, so let's start with defining the center of mass. Is that mass moment or is that a pressure? Um, that is an important question. For us, it's going to be a scalar. Okay. Uh, but when you go to three dimensions, it turns out it's not a vector, it's a matrix. It's a three by three matrix. <laughs> yeah, well, if we get to it, we will. Um, but we have enough to worry about before doing that, you know what I mean? <laughs> okay. 
Oh, and uh, actually, this moment of a force, though, that is a vector. So put the vector symbol over that. OK, so center of mass. Um, so the integral definition of center of mass, you know, there is there are integral definitions for the center of mass and the centroid. We're not really going to use those, but I'm going to give you those. Um, and maybe I'll come back and do uh, an example. So you just see one example of how to use this. Um, but the integral definition of center of mass. Um, in 2D. Um, so this is the position vector of the center of mass. It's um, So you choose a coordinate system, and this would be the coordinates of the center of mass are equal to uh, 1 over the total mass times the integral over the whole body, over that whole mass of the xy positions of some uh, infinitesimal increment of mass times dm. And in 3D, the only ch thing that changes is that we have three of these coordinates instead of two. So um, we'd be calculating the x, y, and z coordinates. Um, and that's equal to 1 over the total mass times the integral over the whole mass of x, y, z, dm. The integral over the, so the, um, the, like the boundaries of the integral, if you think of it as a definite integral, um, are going over the whole body. So uh, like, for example, in 2D, if you're trying to figure out the centroid of a right triangle, you break it up into little slivers. Um, this infinitesimal sliver has some mass, you know, some infinitesimal mass. And then you go through just the, you know, kind of the definition of the integral derivation. Um, usually, we're not going to think of it this way. Um, if the body is homogeneous and uh, so homogeneous means that um, it's the same material everywhere. So this, okay. So if the body is homogeneous, um, the center of mass is the centroid. Think of as just the geometric center of the object. Um, uh, yeah, we are only going to deal with homogeneous. Um, and so for this, in 2D, um, so to calculate uh, the notation that you use for this is the centroid is shown by an overbar. So let's say x bar, y bar, that's the centroid of an object, is equal to 1 over the total area. times the integral over the area of x, y, dA. Um, OK, so you can imagine, so say that we're calculating the geometric center of a disk, OK? Um, it, that's going to end up exactly where you think it would be, right in the middle. But if this disk had one part of it over here that was steel and the rest of it was wood, 
the center of mass would not be in the same space, the same place as the geometric center. So that's how homogeneity to, uh, is required for that uh, connection to be made. Um, so this is true for homogeneous. And in 2D, for this 2D version, it also has to be, um, it also requires uniform thickness. Okay, so, yes. Mm -hmm. I'll be the judge of that. Oh. Um. So for, yeah, uh, I, I mean, I guess there's not really like an overall answer to that because it just depends on what kind of precision you need. Like at some level, nothing's exactly homogeneous. Um, but if, um, so reinforced concrete, is that's a good question. That probably, uh, if you're dealing with a small amount of it, then this won't work. If you're dealing with a really big amount of it, it will work, you know, but it just comes down to the amount of precision you need. Um, we'll see that, um, so the way you would probably do that if you were dealing with a sort of a small, uh, non-homogeneous material, okay, so then you can't use this centroid idea. The way you'd actually do it is you'd, um, treat all the stuff, you take all the concrete in one, you know, one chunk, and you'd calculate the centroid of that and calculate its mass. And then you take the steel and calculate the centroid of that and then consider its mass. And then you'd use a sum formula that I'll give you later to, so um, yeah. All right, so that's the 2D centroid, centroid formula. The 3D centroid formula is like this. So again, it's X, Y bar, X bar, Y bar, Z bar. Uh, in this case, it's not quite as simple as just adding um, a third component. You also now, where we were talking about area for the 2D, uh, now we're talking about volume. So one over the total volume times the integral over the whole volume of X, Y, Z, Uh, D volume. Um, it's not ideal to have to use these uh, integral formulas every time you want to calculate a centroid. Um, so really what we're going to do is uh, for just about any shape you can think of, if there's a way to come up with the general dimensions of a shape, um, then only one person really had to do the integral formula. And from there, we have a formula that relates the centroid to the dimensions. And um, so I'm just gonna give you a list of, you know, common shapes and the way to calculate where that centroid is. There are also, besides those common shapes, there are also uh, two other facts that are gonna make this easier for us. Um, So here are two facts that often simplify centroid calculations. Uh, the first one is um, if you can find, so if the shape that you're interested in has a line of symmetry, that's if you're talking about 2D,
or a plane of symmetry if you're talking about 3D. Um, then the centroid has to lie on that line or plane. So the centroid lies on that line or plane. Okay, so like for example, um, A shape like this, like the Star Trek communicator, um, that only has one line of symmetry, but it does have one, right? If you, um, and for a line of symmetry, you can just think of like cutting out that shape and folding it, and if it matches up, that's a line of symmetry. Um, and so the centroid has to lie on this. That doesn't tell you where the centroid is. Because you still have to figure out where along this line it lies. But it's already cut down the number of calculations you have to do in half. Okay. Um, and then if you have shapes that have more than one uh, line of symmetry, like a rectangle or a circle, so this has a line of symmetry this way. and a line of symmetry this way. Well, it has to lie on both of those. So that means that the centroid is where those intersect. And a circle has infinitely many lines of symmetry but they all cross at the same point. And so the centroid has to be where they all cross. Um. Any questions about that? So to do this in 3D, you need to do it with planes of symmetry. I'm not going to draw that, but um, I mean, any 2D space is really, if we're talking about an actual object, it's really a 3D object. So you can imagine that in 3D, this just could extend some uniform thickness into the board. Um, this line of symmetry is really a plane that cuts it. And so, um, and then if you think of a sphere, uh, instead of lines of symmetry of a sphere, you can cut it with all these different planes, and it works out just the same way that this does. Those planes, you know, all these different directions, uh, they all have one point in common right at the center, and so that has to be the centroid. Okay, the second thing that's really useful, maybe even more useful than this first one, is that um, if a complicated shape is made up of a combination of simple shapes. So for example, uh, if you're trying to calculate the centroid of something like this, okay. Um, well, there's no table anywhere that gives you a formula for the centroid of that shape. Um, but you can break this shape up into a rectangle here, and there's a few ways you could break it up. And so now that complicated shape is made up of four rectangles. And if you know the centroids of those individual shapes, um, then 
uh, the centroid of the complicated shape. is equal to one over the total area, or you can think of this as, well, let's just write total area, times the sum of the area of the individual shape times the centroid of the individual shape. Centroid. So what that says is in whatever coordinate system you're in, if you want to calculate the centroid of this thing, um, the way you do it is find in that coordinate system the centroid of each of these four individual pieces and figure out the area of each of those four individual pieces. And then uh, one over the sum of the areas uh, times the sum of each piece's area times its centroid, sort of like a weighted average. Um, and by the way, if you look at that formula and compare it to the integral definition, it has exactly the same form. It's just like when you go from, uh, from a, the limit of an area to a finite um, approximation of an integral, you switch from the Riemann sum, the integral, to a sum. You know, this has this tangent or uh, the DA, the infinitesimal component of area, and this tangent for the um, for the position of that DA. Um, this has a line of symmetry, by the way. Which direction is the line of symmetry, horizontal or vertical? Okay, so that means that we know the height. Right, and so we don't have to do this with two dimensions. We can just use the x equation from this to calculate the horizontal position of the centroid. Um, you can do the same thing in 3D, and it works just like you would think it would. Um, so x bar, y bar, z bar. is equal to one over the total volume times the sum of, uh, for each of these bodies, um, the volume of the individual, you know, simple shape times the centroid of that individual simple shape. Um, and by the way, I'll do examples like this, but these work with subtraction and addition. Addition and subtraction. Um, so just like you could, I mean, the quickest way to do this is uh, I don't know, this might actually be quicker. So we thought of that as adding up, you know, using this sum formula to add up this shape plus this plus this plus this. But you could also think of it as adding this shape to this big rectangle and then just subtracting this small rectangle. Okay. And so in that case, you would do, um, so for this little shape, you do its area times the centroid of that shape. For the big one, you do the centroid of this big rectangle um, times its area. And then for this one, you say minus the area of what you're removing times the centroid of the thing you're removing. Okay, we'll do an example like that. Um, okay. Uh, so, the last thing I have to do is just give you um, the formulas for some of the simple shapes that we'll use. You can imagine, I'm sure that uh, like 
if you think of a rectangle as the basic simple shape, this is sort of the idea that you used in defining integral, integrals too. Um, you could, whatever complicated shape you want, you could approximate that as, you know, a million or a thousand or a hundred or whatever rectangles, depending on how much precision you need. So um, really by just knowing how to do the centroids of rectangles and knowing that some formula, you could write, say, a computer program that would approximate any shape, you know, the centroid of any shape you want. In a way, that's the only thing you need. But I'll, I'll give you this for some common shapes. Um, okay, so here are centroid formulas. Um, for some common 2D shapes. The first one is a quarter circle. Um, and uh, the centroid is <laughs> that would have been a very rude comment. Okay, so here's the centroid. Um, and so we're gonna think of this distance as um, our X bar and this distance is our Y bar. Um, and for each of these, I'm gonna give you the X bar formula, the Y bar formula, and the area formula. And the reason you need that area formula is so that you can do some simple shapes with the sum formula. Um, all right, well, X bar is 4R over 3 pi. There's a symmetry here, so the Y bar formula has to be the same. And then the area is just a quarter of the area for a circle. So um, pi r squared over four. Um, second, a semicircle. Well, you could easily use the sum formula to figure out that uh, the, the vertical location of the centroid of a semicircle is the same as the vertical location for a quarter circle. Um, but I'm gonna give you this one since uh, it's gonna come up pretty often. Okay, so uh, first of all, well, the centroid is here. Notice first that it has to lie on this line of symmetry. So we don't really need to have a formula for X bar. We know it's gonna be in the middle. The only question is the Y bar. And the formula for this Y bar, so we'll forget about the X one. You can just do that by inspection. But y bar is the same as it was for the quarter circle, 4r over 3 pi. And then the area is um, pi r squared over 2. And then the last shape that we need is a right triangle.
Okay, so this is 90 degrees. And we're going to measure our X bar from the flat side and our Y bar from the flat side. And the dimensions of this triangle we need to give. So um, I'll say that this is H and this is B. Then the formula for the X centroid is B over 3. The formula for the Y centroid is H over 3. And uh, the area is base times height over 2. Um, rectangles and full circles are going to come up all the time too, but we don't need formulas for those because they have multiple symmetries and so you can just find the, you know, just look and see uh, where the center is. Yes. Well, okay, so that brings up kind of an important thing about how you're going to have to use these. All of these things I've given, they sort of, like maybe this notation isn't the best because it looks like those are coordinates. But you need to just think of those as distances. And so, like, for example, sometimes, you know, this quarter circle could be turned the other direction. And the, and the origin could be way over here somewhere. And you're just going to have to use those distances to figure out, you know, what the coordinates are. Okay, so let's, um, let's do a quick example. That's right, they're distances, yep. I mean, coordinates are also distances, but um, these, these don't take any direction into account. Okay, so let's do, um, so let's figure out, um, The centroid of Minnesota will approximate Minnesota. That's supposed to be a semicircle. And um, we'll say this is 400 miles. We'll say this is 400 miles. Um, and so the way we're going to get this is, you know, you can think of this as a square with a length by length of 400 miles, and we've removed a semicircle from it. So this semicircle has uh, a radius of 200 miles. Okay. Um, in order to figure out where the centroid is, come up with coordinates for it. Uh, we're going to have to choose a coordinate system, choose an origin location. Uh, the simplest one would probably be to put it here in Lake Worthington. Okay. Um, we know that there is a line of symmetry. Um, and so we know that from symmetry, I bar is equal to positive 200. That really could not be more annoying. Okay, so Y bar is 200 miles. 
So all we need to calculate is x bar. <laughs> And the way we're going to do that, uh, we have to, so we're going to think of this as a square with a semicircle removed. Um, so for the square, x bar is 200, right? Um, the area. So I'll call this um, sub s cube. The area is 400 times 400. So um, that is 16 times 10 to the 4. Um, so that's 160,000 square miles. Now for the semicircle, um, we can use the formula for the semicircle. And notice that the, the semicircle that we have is split sideways. And uh, what's given is the distance from the flat side to the flat side to the same point. So, what this gives us, this formula 4r over 3 pi, is the distance from here in to the same part of x. You see that? Okay, so um, 4r over 3 pi is 4 times 200 divided by 3 pi. And so that's about um, 84.89, I think. But that's not the coordinate. That's the distance from here. Going the other direction. Okay. Well, so what we want to do is it's going to be 400 and 100 squared there, and then we're going to subtract that and do 400. So x bar uh, for the semicircle is 400 minus 84.89. And so you get 315.11. And then the area is pi r squared over 2. Um, that comes out to about 62,831. So now the formula says x bar is equal to um, 1 over the total area. So that's 1 over 160,000 minus 62,831 since we're removing this material times the area of the square, um, which was 160,000, times the centroid of the square, which was 200, minus 62,831, the area of the semicircle, times the centroid of the semicircle, which was 315.11, And you get that x bar is about uh, 
126. So in other words, um, to get from Worthington to the centroid of Minnesota, um, you go 126 miles east and 200 miles north. Um, I want to show just one example of how to use that that integral formula. You're not going to have to do that. You're just going to have to use the shape, like the example I did of the center of mass of Minnesota last time. Um, okay, so let me do an example. Uh, this is the integral definition of the centroid. Um, and so uh, I gave you the formula for a right triangle. Um, so if you have, and I give it face the other way, but I, I'm going to draw it this way just to sort of emphasize that um, the direction doesn't matter. You have to, you have to think of these centroid uh, values as distances from landmarks. So let's say we have this right triangle, and the centroid is here. Let's call this distance H and this distance B space. Um, then the distance from, so you can always think whatever, um, whatever axis you're looking along, whichever leg you're looking along, there's a, there's like a high side and a point side, you know? And the centroid formula gives you the distance from the wall side going toward the point side. Okay. And so if you flip it around, you just have you have to flip that measurement around too. Um, so this distance here is b over three, and this distance here is h over three. So now we're going to derive that using the integral definition. All right, so let's say, well, I'm going to uh, orient it this way. Um, this is 90 degrees. Um, and this is going to be B, uh, B, the base, and this is going to be H. And I'm going to put the coordinate system, the origin, at the point. So this is the positive x-axis and this is the positive y-axis. Um, and the definition of the centroid, so x bar, y bar, is equal to 1 over the total area times the integral over the whole area of the coordinates of each individual uh, infinitesimal mass uh, times, or infinitesimal piece of area, I guess, times that infinite, 
infinitesimal area. Okay, so that's the definition. And um, we're going to break it up like this. And with an integral, using any kind of integral definition, uh, really the trick to coming up with an answer is coming up with the right way to break up this thing into these infinitesimal pieces. You know, um, like if we were doing this with a, with a disk, we'd probably want to use some kind of polar coordinates or something. It would make more sense. Um, with this one, if you tried to do it in polar coordinates, you know, you'd be here all day. You'd probably still not come up with a good way to answer it. Um, but so what we're going to do is our DAs are going to be these. Like uh, in the definition of a Riemann sum, when you first talked about integrals, um, we're going to break it up into pieces like this. Um, and uh, let's start figuring out so what some of these values are. Um, so the area is base times height over 2. Okay, so uh, 1 over the area is going to be 2 over base times height. And then for this little strip here, um, we have to figure out, so this is our DA, okay? This is one of our DAs. And so we have to figure out the area of that. That's going to be our DA. And we have to come up with the X and Y. And actually, since this is not, um, you know, since this doesn't have infinitesimal dimensions in every direction, what we have to do here is come up with the centroid of that. I mean, that's easy to do, right? Um, but so we need the coordinates of the centroid of that piece. So this is what we need the coordinates of. That's really the center of mass symbol, but I don't have a centroid symbol. Um, all right, so now if we think of doing this, um, in terms of x, because we're going to have to choose some kind of some variable to integrate this over. Let's think of our independent variable as x. We have to represent all this stuff in terms of x. Okay, so um, we have to represent this infinitesimal area in terms of x, and we have to represent the coordinates of the centroid in terms of x. Um, Well, the x location of this thing is just going to be x, right? Um, actually, let's do the da first, and then I think it'll be easier to. So um, this da for a given x value, you know, for some, for any x value. Our DA is going to be just um, the height of that times the thickness of it. So that's going to be Y times DX. Okay, are you with me on that? So for a given, you know, we need to do this for every one of these strips. They all have different X values. But for any given x value, it's going to be the associated y, the height of this, times the thickness. That's just the area of a rectangle. Okay. Um, well, that y is not in terms of x, and we need it to be. So how are we going to come up with y in terms of x? Well, you can see that the y value that we're talking about, you know, the height of this rectangle, is just the value of on this linear function. So if we can come up with... Um, the function y equals mx plus b that represents this, then we can come up with that height in terms of the x value. Uh, we're not going to have to solve for it. We just want it as a function. But what we're going to do is we want, so the y value is going to be equal to mx plus b. Okay. 
and we just want to represent this diagonal line, that hypotenuse. Um, okay, so how are we going to do that? Uh, B, what's the y-intercept uh, when x is equal to 0, y is equal to 0? So that's 0. And then the slope, um, well, we know that over this line, if you follow this line, by the time you rinse and repeat, you've got a run of B. So that slope is H over B. And so for any X value, the associated Y value is H X over B. Okay, so now we can rewrite our DA our, for any X value, the area of that little infinitesimal strip, DA is HX over B DX. Okay. And H and B, you know, those are known. Those are just uh, constants that represent our specific triangle. Okay, so we have that. Um, now what about the, so what else do we need? For this formula, um, we know the total area, so we have that. Now we have a representation for DA for any x value, we have that. Now all we need is a representation of the coordinates of the central of the x grid. Okay. Well, we have the x value is x. Okay. Now we just need the y value of that centroid. And um, given that we know the y value at the top of this rectangle, what's the y value at the middle of this rectangle? Half of that. Yep. It's just the midpoint. Um, so the y centroid. <laughs> of the infinitesimal strip is, uh, you know, one half uh, the, of the y value at the top of the strip. And so that means that the x and y value for our strip, for the centroid, is going to be, well, x for x. But for y, it's going to be one half of this, right, this formula that we got. This represents the, um, you know, the point. at the top of the infinitesimal strip. That's the point on the line. And so this is going to be, so if that formula is hx over b, uh, this is going to be hx over 2b. Uh, no, um, so we're imagining that this thickness, so the thing that makes it infinitesimal is the thickness. So we're imagining this doesn't have any thickness. So on one side, it's like, uh, it's, so you go up x to get to this thing, and then to get to the left side, you'd have to go back half of a dx, which is nothing, and to the right side, it would be plus half a dx, which is nothing. So the whole thing we're just imagining being at the location x. Because this one, now for this one, we're not talking about the area. We're just talking about the location. Um, okay, so now let's put it all into that integral formula. Um, so we have, so 
we have everything now put into the integral formula. Um, and you get the centroid is equal to one over the area, that's two over BH times the integral of the vector x, hx over 2b, times our dA, which is hx over b dx, And we need boundaries for this. What are our boundaries going to be? Zero to B, yep, because we're doing it in terms of X. So it's the boundaries of the X values. Um, and so if we put this together, uh, I'm going to multiply this one at the end. So two, so I'm going to keep this on the outside, the two over BH. And the integral from zero to B uh, is going to be for the X value, H X squared over B. And for the Y value, it's going to be H squared, uh, X squared over two B squared. DX. And now integrate that. I'm going to still keep this outside. So we have the 2 over BH. Um, and uh, if we integrate that first one, we get HX cubed. We're integrating with respect to X. Um, these other things are just constant. So HX cubed over 3B. And uh, for the y component, we have h squared uh, x cubed over 6b squared. And we're evaluating this from x equals 0 to x equals b. Uh, plug in these values. If you plug in zero, you get nothing. So um, all we have to do is plug in B. Uh, so we get H X cubed. Uh, no, I didn't plug it in. H B cubed uh, over 3B for the X component. And for the Y component, we get H squared B cubed over 6 B squared. Um, you can cancel some of this stuff. So cancel one of those B's. Um, and cancel two of these B's. And then plug in, you know, then multiply by the 2 over BH, and you get 2H over 3. No, the 8. Okay. What I wrote is right, right? Uh, you get the, you cancel the 2. I'm trying to talk while I think. Uh, the 2 H's cancel. One of the B's cancels. You get 2B over 3. And then for, um, the second one, multiply that, uh, you cancel, so the B's cancel, this B and this B cancel, uh, one of the H's cancel, and you get uh, 2H over 6, which is 
h over 3. Okay, so this is x bar, y bar. And so let's think about what we calculated, because that looks a little bit different than the formula that I gave you. Um, so we calculated for a triangle going this way, the centroid is over here. Um, and we calculated that this distance is h over 3. And we calculated that this distance is 2b over 3. But since the whole thing is b, that means that this distance is b over 3. And so the formula that's given that I gave you last time uh, is that the height from the flat side to the centroid is h over 3, and the distance from the flat side to the centroid is b over 3. Yeah, that's right. No, no, I don't think I don't think there are any problems that I assigned where you have to use that integral formula. I just want you to see one of them. Um, but you can see from this why using that centroid formula doesn't end up being that, that useful a thing usually because any shape that anybody's ever done the centroid formula for, they've come up with a simple algebraic formula that you can use from then on, you know? So all you, like, you never have to use the centroid formula if you have a smart friend, you know? <laughs> or if you had a smart older brother or whatever. They already did it. And then also, because of the sum formula, I mentioned this before, to um, so say you wanted to calculate uh, say you wanted to calculate the centroid of this shape. Okay, that's a mess, but if you break it up into skinny rectangles. Um, and you can you can think of it as the sum of all these skinny rectangles. Okay. And um, as long as you make them skinny enough, you can get it as precise as you want. And so you most likely do this with a computer program, not by hand. But you just figure out what the centroid was in each of these rectangles, which is easy because of the symmetry. And then you just add up, you know, use the sum formula to come up with the centroid of the whole complicated shape. Yep. What if you need the centroid? of a non-right triangle. Because uh, that calculation I just did and the formula I gave you last time is just for right triangles. So what if you, um, What if you had to do a triangle like that or a triangle like that? <clears throat> well, um, the key idea is you can always break up any triangle into a combination of right triangles. So just make this into this and use the sum formula make this into this and use the sum formula. Okay, so that right triangle formula is really all you need. 